I have been preaching for several weeks on finding freedom. And I'm going to end it today, but why does it keep prolonging, Pastor? Because I keep finding things that I struggle with. I'm just being honest. I keep finding things that I struggle with. And I say to myself, if I'm struggling with it, perhaps some other people are struggling with it too. See, the best of men are just men at best, folks. Don't look to any man. Don't look to any woman. Look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. No, we're just, we're just humans. Don't, don't put them up on a pedestal. They're not that good. You're comparing your weaknesses to their strengths. You're comparing your weaknesses to their strengths. They're not that good. They're just mortals that have good points and bad points. But I want us to take our Bible and go to Ephesians chapter 4. Can we do that? Let's stand to our feet or Bible or iPad or iPhone. I think within 55 to 60 minutes, I can preach this message. Ephesians chapter 4, I want to call your attention to verse 26. Look what it says. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What does that mean? Paraphrase that means. That means if you and your wife have a discord, deal with it quickly. Amen? Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands that which is good. Now, there won't anything work in your life until you do. Works a four-letter word that Americans need to learn. That he may have to give to him that needeth. Verse 29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And then verse 30 says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But look what verse 32 says. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Let us pray. Jesus, we love you. And I pray today that you'll make our tongue a ready writer's pen. God, we need you more than we need anything else. The people need to hear another voice other than mine. And so, Holy Spirit, come and work and manifest yourself. And for all you do, I'm going to give you glory, honor, and praise. For I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Until you come, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about freedom from anger. Freedom from anger. A father and daughter were riding in a crowded elevator. Suddenly, a woman in front of them turned around and slapped the father's face. The elevator stopped. The woman immediately stormed off, gave a venomous look at the man as she got off the elevator. The father was obviously shaken and confused. He looked at his daughter and said, honey, what's the problem? The little girl answered, daddy, she's a mean lady who just likes to hurt people. I didn't like her either. She kept on stepping on my toes. She did it so much, Daddy, that I pinched her on the bottom as hard as I could. <laughs> That's when she started picking on you. <laughs> now, folks, I want to talk to you about anger. And I know tons of people that are angry. Some are angry with God. Some are angry with life. Some are angry with their past. Some are angry with their mate. Some are angry with family members. Some are angry with situations. But I know tons of people that battle this issue that I'm talking about, freedom from anger. I researched it and I found out some interesting things. I found out that the average woman gets angry and loses her temper three times a week. The average woman, the woman that you're married to, loses her temper three times a week. The average man, he loses his temper six times a week. And all the women said, Amen. all right. <laughs> women, women 
get angry at people. Men get angry at things like computers, like machines, like mechanical things. Women get angry at people, but men get angry at things. Now, women are more verbal in their anger. When a woman gets angry, she talks about it. Women are verbal in their anger. Men are more physical in their anger. This was interesting. Single adults express anger twice as much as married adults. Single adults express anger twice as much as married adults. I've had single people say, I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy because I'm not married. If I get married, I'll be happy. No, no, no. You've got destination disease. You won't be happy. You'll make somebody else unhappy. <laughs> and the place we're most likely to express anger is at home. I found out, folks, in my life, that if I can be a good Christian at home, I can be a good Christian anywhere. And if you can be a good Christian at home, you can be a good Christian anywhere. Now, Dr. S.I. McMillan said there are 51 illnesses directly attributed to anger. Proctologists tell us this, that anger can literally cause you to experience pain in the rear. Somebody said to dwell above with those we love, that will be glory. But to dwell below with those we know, that's a different story. Now, anger's not wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Anger's not wrong. I've said this, I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a man or woman that couldn't get angry. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a man or woman that on certain times couldn't get angry. But I want you to know this, uncontrollable anger is wrong. Uncontrollable anger, when it controls you, rather than you controlling it, it's wrong. I realize this, the Bible says, the Bible never contradicts itself. And Ephesians 4 and 26 says, be ye angry and sin not. You know what that tells me, folks? That tells me if anger was sin, Jesus was a sinner. If anger is sin, Jesus was a sinner. Because by the way, on about three different occasions I read of in the scripture, he got really torqued. He, he got really torqued. He got really angry. See, first of all, Jesus got angry when the people had hard hearts. He got angry when the people had hard hearts. You can read about it in Mark. In the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, they were more interested in basically the traditions than they were ministering to people. And Jesus got angry over their hard hearts. But I'll tell you a second reason why Jesus got angry. He got angry over their haughty hearts. He got angry over their haughty hearts because in Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, they were bringing some little children to see Jesus. And the disciples said, no, 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 no. He don't have time for the little children. He needs to be meeting with the more important people. And Jesus said to those guys, you suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was saying those children are just as important to me as anybody else. And see, folks, when we treat somebody on a different level because of their race, or we treat somebody on a different level because of their sex, or we treat somebody on a different level because of their position, and we treat somebody on a different level because of their economic status, and we treat somebody on a different level because of their popularity, we deem they're more important than somebody else. I want you to know something. There's nobody any more important than anybody else to the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves all people. God loves all people. I know people in Christendom that can strut sitting down, but that's wrong because God loves all people. See, he got angry over hard hearts. He got angry over haughty hearts. But I'll tell you something else. If you read Mark chapter 11, 
he got angry over hypocritical hearts. He got angry over hypocritical hearts. He came to the temple one time and they had turned it into a Walmart blue light special. And let me tell you what he did. He came in there and he started turning the tables over. He took a whip and he put it to those guys' backside. You understand this, folks. Don't you ever get in your mind, Jesus was some wimpy man. Jesus was a man's man. Jesus was a man's man. I mean, he turned the tables over and he said to those guys, no, no, you've made it about the wrong thing. You, 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 you've made it about the wrong thing. You've made my house about the wrong thing. You've made it about gold when it should be about God. You've made it about silver when it should be about souls. You've made it about money when it should be about men. You've made it about pleasure when it should be about prayer. And folks, let me say this. They were buying and selling for their own gain. But he was not only upset over what they were doing. He was upset over what they were not doing. He said, because my house should be a house of prayer. My house should be a house of prayer. He didn't say his house would be a house of worship. He didn't say his house would be a house of proclamation of the gospel. But he said four times, my house ought to be a house of prayer. My house ought to be a house of prayer. Now, here's what I want you to see, folks. There's an anger that we ought to have. It ought to anger us when young girls are being sold into sex trafficking. It ought to anger us when somebody's treated less than because of the color of their skin. It ought to anger us when people go to bed hungry every night while we have so much. It ought to anger us that we live in a country that says we ought to redefine marriage. We ought to redefine marriage. We don't need to redefine marriage. God has already defined what marriage ought to be. Those things ought to anger us. You say, Pastor Benny, you're narrow-minded. I don't want to be, listen folks, I don't want to be any narrow-minded than the Lord was. And I want to preach what God teaches. And Psalms 97 and 10 says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. Now there's a healthy anger, but I want you to know something else. <laughs> there's an unhealthy anger. And it's, it's expressed four ways. I want to give them to you. Number one, machine guns. You say, who are the machine guns? Those are the people that just mow you down. They just let you have it. They're walking time bombs. 60% of the homicides in our country are committed by angry family members. Everybody's on pins and needles around them because at anything, they'll explode. They'll explode at the drop of a hat and they'll drop the hat. They're just machine guns. They're literally walking time bombs. Cain was one in the Bible. His anger in Genesis 4 and 5, he goes out, he's wroth, and he kills his brother. They're machine guns. But not only do people express their anger being machine guns, but they express their anger being mutes. You say, what do you mean being mutes? They don't blow up, they clam up. Oh, now, they're angry. It's burning deep inside, but they don't speak for three days. They do something called pouting. They're angry, they're pouting, and they want everybody to know they're pouting. They want everybody to know that they're angry. Don't you, don't you elbow him again. Listen to me, all right. <laughs> They're machine guns, and then they're mutes, but then they're martyrs. Who are the martyrs? Well, the, the martyrs on a pity party. The martyr says, when I was in the third grade, everybody got a cookie in the class but me. And that's why my life has turned out the way it has. 
I'm going to have me a pity party. I want everybody to know how I was wronged. Folks, the only thing about these pity parties is nobody comes to your party and nobody brings a gift. Amen? How can you tell a martyr? I'll tell you how you can tell a martyr. Because what is anger? What is depression? Depression's anger turned inward. And before long, they're depressed because they're a martyr. But then there's a, there's a fourth way we express anger. That's manipulators. Manipulators. You say, what are, what are you talking about, manipulators? They say, no, no. I'm not going to get mad, but I'm going to get even. I, I'm not going to get mad. I'm, I'm going to e, get even. And they use indirect ways to get even. They'll drop indirect statements. They'll give what they say is jokes, but they're really wanting to cut you. Anybody know anybody like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to cut you. And then when you say, well, that hurt, they'll say, well, can't you take a joke? They never meant for it to be a joke. They were intentional and malicious in it. They're manipulators. Their whole objective is, no, no, they hurt me, but, but, but I'll get even. Now, now, here's what I want you to understand. You say, Brother Benny, I, I need to see a psychologist. I need to see a psychiatrist. I need to see a, uh, somebody, a therapist, because I really want to understand the steps of anger. No, 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 you don't have to see anybody. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give it to you today for free. No, you don't have to pay $150 an hour. You'll get it in the next 15 minutes if you'll come up real close. What, 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 what are the steps, Pastor Benny? What are, what are the steps? Well, the Bible tells us, see, see, after everything's said and done, the Bible is the foundation of everything. The, the Bible, folks, what we need is the Word of God. What we need is the Word of God. But what we need is teachers and preachers, not our philosophy. Just teach the Word of God. That's what we need. Just get up there and preach the word. See, it, it tells us the steps. It all begins with bitterness. What is bitterness? It's somebody has done me wrong feeling. It's when you feel like somebody has done you wrong. What I mean, and here's what I want you to understand. What you feel may not be real, but it's real to you. And when you feel like somebody has done you wrong. And Hebrews 12 and 15 even talks about the root of bitterness. See, the foundation of everything, it all starts with bitterness. But I want you to know it doesn't stay with bitterness. It moves to wrath. See, the Old Testament primarily was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. The word wrath there comes from the Greek word and it means to burn, to burn. And what it does, it just burns you up. And the more you think about it, the madder you get. Anybody ever been there and done that, got the t-shirt to prove it? Yeah. It starts out with, with bitterness. It moves to wrath. It just burns you up. And then it goes to anger. See, wrath is what we feel. But anger is what people see. Anger is wrath turned inside out. It starts out with bitterness. It moves to wrath. It moves to anger. And then it moves to clamor. What is clamor, pastor? It's loud yelling. It's loud yelling. It's when somebody says, you don't have to yell. And you say, I'm not yelling. <laughs> Boy, I'm just preaching where we live, amen. <laughs> and then it moves from clamor to evil speaking. We start saying those things. We start saying those hurtful things and we're thinking all about all the hurtful things that we can possibly say, never realizing that a sharp tongue cuts our own throat. We get so angry, we don't even realize what we're saying. Guy got a new suit and he was standing waiting on a bus with two other men. He was proud of his new suit, 
About that time, he was standing there with those two men. A car came by and hit the puddle and splashed dirty water up on his suit. And he said these words. He said, did you two idiots see what that gentleman did to me? Did you two idiots see what that gentleman did to me? He didn't even realize what he was saying. And then number six, it moves to malice. What is malice? It's wickedness. It's when what's verbal turns to physical. Get this, folks. Six represents man. Every number in the Bible represents something. Number three represents God. Six represents man. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking with all malice. Now, here's what I want you to say. Pastor, that's the process. But how can I get victory over anger? I, I, I really think, Pastor, I, I, I want to get victory. I know you do. See, folks, I, I don't want to be like that man who was angry all of his life. He was angry his entire life and had printed on his tombstone when he died. What are you looking at? I don't want to be that way, and you don't either. But here's what I know. You can get victory over anger. You say, Pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand the extent I am. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. I understand. And you can get victory. Now, have you and your mate ever had any fusses? No, Pastor, a liar. Sure, but Brother Benny, you and Miss Barbara ever had any fuss? No, no, we've never had a fuss. We've had some intensive fellowship. I told her the other day, we was going at it. I said, baby, we've got to meet in the middle. We've got to meet in the middle. She said, you're exactly right. I said, if you'll admit you're wrong, I'll admit I'm right. And we can meet right in the middle. <laughs> you know, you start out, you're discussing, and then the volume increases a little bit. You ever been there? You know, yeah, it, it increases a little bit, and it increases a little bit. And, before long, it's getting real loud. And you're just kind of going at it. You've probably been there. If you've not, you'll get there. I promise you. <laughs> but you know what's amazing? About that time, the phone rings. And you're going at it. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you've done it. Yeah, 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 you've done it. You've done it. Hello. Everything, oh, everything's great. Yeah, we can get victory. But you say, Pastor, how, how, how can I get victory over anger? Well, well let, let me tell you six steps, and I'll, I'll hit them as fast as I can. Step number one, you've got to calculate. Calculate. And what I mean this, when you lose your temper, you always lose. When I was a boy, I used to lose my temper, but my mother helped me to find it. But when you lose your temper, you always lose. It might be respect. It might be relationship. It may be finances. It may be a host of things. But I'll promise you, folks, hot heads and cold hearts don't solve anything. Hot heads and cold hearts don't solve anything. And you got to calculate. you got to realize, what's this going to cost me? I... Most of you know I love football. I love college football. I really believe this is the year for the Tennessee Vols. <laughs> this is our year. But there was a college football coach from Ohio. He won five national championships. He won 238 games. He was a coaching machine. But one decision cost him everything. This was the decision. That player from Clemson intercepted that ball and Woody Hayes went out on the field and started hitting that player 
And it cost him everything. It cost him his career. It cost him everything, ladies and gentlemen. And here's what I'd say. We better calculate. What's my anger going to cost me? But there's a second step. We better consider. And I won't camp here long. But here's all I want you to see, folks. Hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. And many times when somebody lashes out at you, it's simply because they have hurt in their lives. I was in a situation yesterday. I was in a situation yesterday. Literally. A guy approached me. And here's what rolled in my mind. In a store. I didn't know the guy. But here's what rolled in my mind. Not am I big enough to do something about it. But what rode in my mind, am I big enough not to do something about it? Not am I big enough to do something, but I mean, am I big enough not to do something about it? Here's what I, I remember when they were having all those presidential debates. And those guys was on the stage lashing out at one another. And Ben Carson said, I think it takes more strength not to do that. I, take, I think it takes more strength not to do that. Not are you big enough to do something, but are you big enough not to do something? There's a third step, and that is confront. That is confront, and what I mean by confront, you've got to say, hey, I've got to be honest. I've got to own it. I do have a problem. I, I do have a problem. I get angry. I say things I shouldn't say. I've got to confront it. Then there's a fourth step, and I've got to confess it. I've got to confess. You know what confess means? It means agree. I've got to confess it to God. I've got to own it, and then I've got to say, God, I'm wrong. God, my anger problem's wrong. God, I need help. I've got to confess it to you. And then there's a fifth step. Ladies and gentlemen, that fifth step is commit. I've got to say, no, no. Lord, I need your help. I need your Holy Spirit. See, folks, it's a great day. It was a great day in my life when I realized there's no good in me. Years ago, when I was starting out preaching, Jimmy Swagger used to sing an old song, and he said, if any good is found in me, it's just because of Calvary. And folks, if any good's found in any of us, it's just because of Jesus. There, there's no good in us. It's only because of Jesus. And what we have to do is say, we've got to commit and say, Lord, I need you. I need you, Holy Spirit. I need more of you, Holy Spirit, in my life. Because look, folks, look what the Bible says in Galatians. But the Holy Spirit produces this in your life, this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You say, Pastor, I need some self-control. No, no, you need more of the Holy Spirit. You need more of the Holy Spirit. We all need more of the Holy Spirit. And that's why on a regular basis, we need to say, Lord, I need your spirit. I need your spirit. I need a fresh feeling of your presence. I need your spirit more than I need anything else. I was getting ready to come to church this morning. And Barbara said to me, we got to get some toothpaste, Benny. I wonder why they don't call it teeth paste. I don't know. but into... <laughs> She said, we, 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 we got to get some toothpaste, Benny. And I said, I went into a little store and I said, well, while, while I'm here, I'll just get some. And you know, I've got this tube right here. Hadn't used any out of it. And, and, and this may sound silly to you, but Barbara, I put it under the faucet and I couldn't get anything in it. I couldn't get any water in it. I couldn't get it to dilute down. And the reason why I couldn't, it's full, folks. So when you push it, what comes out of it's teeth paste. (laughs) 
Let me tell you something. If I'm full of the Holy Spirit, when you push me, what's going to come out? Yeah. But some of us are not full of the Holy Spirit and other stuff's coming out. You okay? Because we're not full of the Holy Spirit and stuff's coming out that shouldn't come out. And words are coming out that shouldn't come out. And statements are coming out that shouldn't come out. Because you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit more than we need anything else. We need the Holy Spirit of God. So we calculate, we consider, we confront, we confess, we commit. But uh, I'll tell you something else we do. We change. You know, I had this wonderful privilege today. I enjoyed something. I know all of our campuses are, some of you are watching. You're having great services. But I had the wonderful privilege today, before this service started, of baptizing a young lady. It's a wonderful privilege. And I don't know if she totally understand, understood. Perhaps she did. But what is she doing? She's forming her identity. She's identifying as a member of the bride of Christ. She's identifying. See, uh, I, I was baptized in one time and a little girl said to me, I, Pastor Benny, I, the next time you do that, I want to be advertised. <laughs> and she didn't understand, but she was really right. It is an advertisement. It's an advertisement. It's, it, it, it's kind of like this, this wedding band. This wedding band doesn't make me married. I could have put it on before I got married. But I, I wear it every day. I don't think I've ever taken it off. Because it's a symbol that I am married. I'm identifying as a married man and I'm married to Barbara. And see folks, when you come to know Christ... He becomes your identity. And if your identity is based on anything else, you're going to struggle with insecurities. See, all of our insecurities are the root of our anger. All of your insecurities, all my insecurities are the root of my anger. See, your security can't be your job because you can lose it. It can't be your good looks because they're going to pass. It, it can't be your mate because they may die or leave. It can't be popularity because that will pass. It's got to be in Jesus or you will care too much about the approval or disapproval of others. You've got to change and realize that my self-esteem is in Christ. I'm a child of the Most High God. And God loves me. God loves me so much he sent his son to die for me. And I'm thumb body to God. And God's got a special purpose for my life. And God's got a plan for my life. And there's royal blood flowing through my veins. I'm, I am the head and not the tail. I am a victor. I'm not a victim. I am not going to be overcome. I'm an overcomer. And if God be for me, who can be against me? And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And I can do all things through Jesus Christ who who strengthens me and I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me because I've got a God that's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Why, he's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of conquerors. He's the head of heroes. He's the leader of legislators. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. He's 
He's my Lord of Lords. There's none like him. And I take my identity in him because I'm a child of the most high God. I am somebody because I know him.